Hi everyone. In this podcast style episode, my sister Bea and I discuss the Saturn archetype via its mythological and astrological meanings. And if you want to hear what next follows, which is Uranus, you can find it at our podcast site via the web link or through any podcast app on your phone. You will see all of these links in the description of this post. Enjoy. Welcome to Archetypes and the Planets, where Andre Carr and I, Bea Gonzalez, invite you to think metaphorically as we explore how we have collectively translated the map of the sky into our mythologies, religious systems, and personal psychology. Okay, so last time we spoke, Andre, we spoke about Jupiter, uh, and then today we're speaking about the planet that follows Jupiter, uh, Saturn, and how these two are linked together. We talked about that in the previous episode, but I think I want to return to that because I think once people understand the significations of Saturn, they might understand why the ancients paid so much attention to the conjunction of these two planets, the coming together of these two planets every 20 years in the sky and what it meant, because they certainly had very definitive ideas. And it's such a big story right now because we've had this meeting uh, in an era sign uh, just recently, which initiated a whole new era. Uh, So we'll talk about that later. But just to start off, why don't you give us some of the general words that are associated with Saturn archetypally, what, what the meaning of Saturn is? Well, Saturn is the the counterpoint to Jupiter, at least in that sense, that anything that expands is Jupiter, anything that contracts is uh, Saturn. So one way to understand it is to look around the world and anything that has a kind of uh, extra solidity. So for instance, ice would be Saturn, but not water, the right. condition of of water as ice is Saturn because it's it's congealed. It's it's apparently solid. I mean, a scientist would say, no, it isn't because there's a lot of space between the molecules. That's not the point. It's more solid than not. And then in your in your own body, the hardest uh, part of it, the skeleton, your teeth, the things that basically hold you up, you would be a blob of protoplasm if you didn't have Saturn to hold you up. Hence, Saturn, any structure, now you move from there, any form you see, a house, a car, anything that has any kind of apparent temporary form, because that's where nothing is permanent. But, you know, a wall is pretty permanent. If you run into it, you discover, you know, at least in that context, it'll hurt. So Saturn is completely integrated into life in in all kinds of ways um, so that it it becomes an extremely important uh, planet and then you can think about it is that it rules many many different things such as for instance as chronos the lord of time you can argue that entire human existence in a way is a what is it a battle with time a study of time Mm -hmm. learning to relate to time all of that stuff Uh, you notice that most animals they don't relate to time in the same way they're in a kind of present moment something or other but without any broader awareness humans have that capability to project into the future to know they're on a on a perpetual clock they're always estimating their age and so forth so all of that right. is saturnian so you begin to realize that making a good relationship to that planet is kind of crucial yeah, you know, yeah. Um, so it, it's interesting um you know from the perspective of where this all evolved saturn was considered the greater malefic uh, you know, Mars is the lesser and Saturn is the the greater. And there was a, you know, if you read uh, some of the older uh, writers on Saturn, it's extremely negative to the point of almost comical, you know, just how, you know, your boils and, and the people basically born under this uh, sign cannot be trusted. And it was an extreme. And I think it's probably to do with what you have to say that your Saturn is the limit between the visible world and the invisible world. Mm-hmm. And so really does denote that that for most people looking up at the sky, what you can see from what you can't, and what you can't see means death, right? And so there is 
to me, it makes sense that it would be associated with uh, with uh, all of these connotations of dark and melancholia. And but it, there's also, you know, one of the things that I'm really thinking about lately is about how this whole system of thinking is a philosophy built around light. And if you think of the two signs that Saturn rules, which are Capricorn and Aquarius, it is when the light is the least potent in the sky, right? We have we have the shorter nights, although it starts growing with Capricorn because that's at the uh, solstice. But it's the idea that we're living in a perpetual, in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, you're living in a perpetual winter of sorts. Um, and w- even if, they, if you're living in a, in a place where it's not as cold, you're still dealing with a lack of light. And what's also interesting to me is that both signs oppose the luminary signs, Cancer and Leo, where the lights are. So this seemed to me, you know, Liz Green said that Sat- she thought Saturn was as important as the sun because those two planets, Saturn is the backbone of the chart, which actually is interesting because Saturn also rules the back, right? <laughs> so it makes sense. Um, but it's the idea that you can't really, that, that it provides the structure for the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so without, and we know that people who do not manage Saturn well have a problem structuring their lives and that there is a, you know, there's a healthy need for that. So that's the first thing that struck me, just the lack of light, the fact that it's associated with cold. That's one of it's called melancholia. Um, you know, and already these are the the uh the the things that we don't deal well in life. But the other thing is that I think it's also associated with harsh reality. I think Jupiter takes you to the world of possibility and I can do this. And then you hit Saturn right after. And you notice the Saturn is in, in, in basically encased between two Jupiter ruled signs. It's like the limits of what you can do. Imagination is one thing. The reality is what is actual, actually possible. And you think, oh, okay, well, that's very negative because reality is very harsh. But I would argue that, in fact, the mature person and mature is a word that is associated with Saturn, maturing, maturity, maturity understands that life is, you have to deal with limitation. That is part of life. I I find that uh, one of the archetypes that's not talked about enough with Saturn is the old wise man, the idea that it's the Dumbledore, the Gandalf, the idea that it it confers a sort of dignity of a person who has come to terms with their own limitations and has come to terms with limitations that life imposes through the vehicle of time. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so we go back to the time and you, you, you reference Cronus, which of course is time. And it's time in a specific, we have two types of time. We have Kairos, which is mythological time. You can, this is the time that expands and, and, um, and goes beyond the limits of reality. And that's an important way of looking at the world. But without the, this other type of time being taken into account, uh, you're missing part of the picture. So to that end, you maybe want to talk about the fact that Saturn is very known in the popular culture now. Even Adele had a, you know, the singer is, is, has been talking about the Saturn return, this moment in time that a lot of people speak about and know about now as astrology became more popular, about the notion that the Saturn orbit is it returns to the place it was when you were born around the, between the ages of about 28 to 30. And most people experience the first Saturn return because of course there will be a second Saturn return. And for those lucky few, there will be even a third. But at each point, there is a maturing of the personality. In fact, a number of uh, writers think that you don't actually mature till you hit the 28 to 30 year old point. It's almost like you understand, listen, it was all fun and games, and now I better commit to something. I better commit to buying furniture and finding a place and finding a partner, whatever it is that you're committing. Of course, buying furniture doesn't seem so, it seems silly, but in fact, I've noticed people doing things like that, that they get very serious about, I need to find something material that links me to reality, to the fact that I can no longer daydream and walk around with my head in the clouds. So tell me a little bit about what you think in your experience as a consulting astrologer like me, what you've experienced as, and, and I would also mention that there is a second sound return and it's the same theme, but a very different. Can you give me some, some stories or some ideas that have come up uh, in your in your consultations with that specific notion of Saturn returning and maturing you? Right. So the, the the first one is near 30. The second one is near 60, more like 59, because it's 29.5. So in that range is where you get the two returns. And they're both, uh, yes, maturing points. They're, they're points where the momentum of a person's life coalesces so that uh, there's an experience of what one has been doing and reaching a point now where it's time to, to in a sense, call a halt, take stock and decide, okay, where am I going to go from here? 
and one experiences the limitations of what one did up to that point, but also the clarity of setting new limits, let's say, because limits that way are very useful. That's a Saturnian keyword. Mm -hmm. You realize I only have so much time in the day, not even so much about time in my life in a broad sense, so much time in the day to do what I can do. Other times it could be, or other in other instances, it could be, I need to stop doing X, Y, Z because that's causing me problems. That's a Saturn, uh, Saturn in the sense of releasing, dropping something. Saturn has a no force. Um, but the key idea is probably around time in that one aspect of it is the time I've spent reaching this return from age zero to age 30 has brought me here. That's the totality of my current karma. Then you set a new cycle in motion and you reach another point at the second return. Second return is another opportunity to set directions again. And there is where it could be a great return and that the person's wisdom, as you put it, has accrued over time. Again, Saturn needs time you know, to cook and bake and go through the whole process of life. Yeah. But it could also be a very dangerous time. There are plenty of people that the second Saturn return can be lethal. For example, the late Alan Watts, who was a great philosopher, mm -hmm. some of his videos are on YouTube and they're well worth listening to. It's mostly audio, really, that you hear. He was also a pretty committed alcoholic. And so by the time he was reaching his Saturn return, his body just broke. He couldn't, yeah. Yeah. He couldn't make it through. And so these are... These are patterns that are working at the same time. They're all, you know, churning. And yet, you know, the feeling is unmistakable. Any, any person who is aware of their Saturn cycles, especially those two, there are many others, Saturn to the sun and so forth. But those two, yes, there's no question that they are extremely um, important, obvious, you know, as, as they're happening and, and it, right. it, it, the directional change that takes place. Right, right. I was thinking about Saturn too in respect of building a backbone. And I think one of the things Saturn seems to do is it seems to, because we're going to be moving from Saturn now to the invisible planets, the archetypal, the truly archetypal planets, which I think can be more overwhelming because you don't know they're there. So these are the archetypal forces, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Uranus, that can take over without you even realizing it. So Saturn's actually the barrier between the seen and then the unseen, as I said before. And so if you're building a backbone, you could use, and I was thinking about this today, you could use the idea of practice or discipline to build enough. You, know, you, could, you do that when you do weightlifting, for example, you build your body or you, or you do cardio, but you can also build, I think, with Saturn using the key words for, for Saturn, practice, discipline, um, the, the, the ability to, to repeat something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can use it to also build a backbone against these archetypal powers uh, through something like mindfulness or through meditation. And that uh, one of the problems you have with the intrusions of the archetypal world into, the, into, the, into your psyche is that you're not prepared. You don't have the wall, the, fa the, the defenses to be able to not be overwhelmed. And I was thinking about this with respect to the fact that Saturn is often associated with depression, right? We always hear depression, Saturn. Are you having a Saturn trend? Oh, you must be depressed. Or is it wired into you to one of your planets at birth, right? Okay. And I think depression happens. Uh, if you think of the word depression, it's depressing your consciousness level. So other forces can walk in. But I, I'm very taken with a very Saturnian type of writer, a Jungian writer named James Hollis, who always argues that Depression happens in service to you, right? And that it's helping you understand that you're not on the path that is aligned to the larger self. This is the Jungian way of, of doing it. So he's always telling people that when moments of depression, which we hate, think of the word depression associated economically, right? Our actual moments of realignment, if you're able to look at it from that perspective and not say, well, you know, there's an, I'm just going to end it all. It's the idea that a part of your psyche wants to be heard. And you can't, and you're, 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 you know, at the, it's trying to enter. And of course, if your defenses aren't really well established, well, what happens is you will be overwhelmed. But if you've spent a lot of your life working on that part of you that uh, receives, is able to receive it, then at least you can put it in its proper context and say, okay, this is a moment uh, when I need to go internal, I need to go inside. And uh, perhaps, uh, not be doing what I did before, but it, it's a, it's a moment of reevaluation. 
And um, so when I look at depression, again, another key word that is often associated with, see, Saturn gets a really bad rap, right? I mean, every time you, you hear Saturn, not only from the ancients, it's today, it's like, oh, Saturn. Um, but there are gifts that Saturn has that maybe because I'm so Saturnian myself, but there are gifts that it brings uh, in the, in the, from the perspective of giving you discipline, which is, which is, you know, sometimes again, seen negatively, but I can see it. Well, often it is our lack of discipline that creates problems for us, right? We've been too much in the Jupiter world and, you know, we're sugared up. And so talk a little bit about that, about how we can take a planet that is necessary, you know, and, and we shouldn't sugarcoat it. Saturn transits are no fun. I mean, I think anybody can agree with that, right? It, when they come into the building, you feel them and your back starts to hurt and you, you, you're you more susceptible to, to infections, it seems. You end up with a cold after not having one for a long time. So there are limitations that it brings in, but maybe speak to how we can use Saturn because that's a lot of your orientation is to take planetary archetypes and turn them into something that, that works for you as against and not against you, and how this one can actually be one that that is really important for me able to turn around maybe a narrative that you're living that isn't really working for you. Yeah, that, well, yeah, Saturn, Saturn is is critical. The, the word discipline actually means to be the disciple of something. It's it's a learning word. So Saturn's discipline is really the discipline of wisdom meaning you're living and you realize something that you're doing is not helping you. And typically it's something you'll stop doing because Saturn is a no force. Although from the positive end, you could also say Saturn as the cross above the crescent is the natural work planet. And sometimes it can be, for example, I'm going to do something. I'm going to write a book or I'm going to really anything you have to then get down to it and the getting down to it is Saturn is where you have to sacrifice your fun you know which would be Jupiter to get down to it so you are focusing that's actually the deepest word I've come up with for Saturn because the act of focusing is a narrowing of the mind to the task at hand which then also leads you into another really interesting area which is where you realize that this, this focus is a conscious act in a way, right? And people are always going on about, okay, well, we need to be conscious. We need to be more aware, more conscious. You cannot do that without Saturn, at least at first. Saturn is the deliberate, uh, deliberate act of becoming more conscious, which is the idea of I'm going to be here, be present to see what is coming through, right? And then in due time, that process might become easier, which then would be more relegated to the subconscious, which is better actually than, you know, uh, than having it be conscious all the time, but still has to go through the Saturn process of I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to be here and I'll know that I'm doing something. Right? All of that is Saturnian. And how do you progress without the Saturn? You can't. And what I notice in my own chart is that, yes. Saturn transits always challenge, no question. Absolutely. Although part of the reason they do is because they show you the mistakes you were making leading up to that point. Like, for yes. example, <laughs> you, you get a cold, trace it back. You almost always run yourself on too much speed or too much, too little sleep, and you get a cold. Saturn says, Well, why are you blaming me? Why don't you pay attention <laughs> to what you're doing, as an example, right? Yeah. Or you develop a stress injury. But what were you doing before? Yeah. Right? Now, not always, but frequently. And at the same time, if you're going to get anything done, Saturn is almost always there. I remember years and years ago, I had this mistaken notion that if Saturn was transiting in soft aspect to someone's planets, they would say, oh, I don't like my job and uh, I need to leave. And, and I would say, well, you know, Saturn is sextile, Saturn is trying. You can do it. They would never do it. They would always wait for the square. Or the opposition or the conjunction when Saturn really became a challenging force. Right. So this is the constant catch-22 of astrology that if you resist the energy of challenging transits, you are literally resisting the opportunity that your fate is presenting you to be able to change. And Saturn is the builder, you know, mm -hmm. even though it's also the one that can can destroy the building. Yes, it can. It can something to the karma of your life and so forth. If you're gonna build something. Saturn is, is, you know, needs to be there. So these are things to, you know, explore in terms of the positive side of it. Otherwise, yes, it's a, it's a very depressing 
energy. And certainly, I mean, if you're looking at, you know, politicians' lives and and that kind of thing, where you've, in a sense, you, you necessarily give up a lot of your faith because you are entering bigger and bigger patterns. Yeah, you don't want Saturn opposed at key moments or square because that's not going to be good. The other thing, too, by the way, is that there is a difference between saying a person is in a Saturn cycle because their entire sign is getting challenged, as is the case right now for Pisces, Sagittarius, right. Gemini, and Virgo. But the overall pattern is doable. When it's really close, that's ex more challenging, more difficult. The, the counsel there is be careful, which comes down to, again, be aware that it's there. Then you can get better at dealing with it. You know, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you know the work of John Sarno, Dr. John Sarno, who did a lot of uh, uh, work on uh, the back, the issue of back aches and its relationship to psychosomatic symptoms, which mm -hmm. the, he, he noted that in the late 80s, uh, people stopped having ulcers because ulcers were suddenly discovered by um, Barry Marshall over in Australia to be related to H. pylori, I had an infection. I know this very well because I had that infection and I suffered until I was able to get the antibiotics to cure it. Um, and so he said that people prior to that were associating stress with ulcers, right? Oh, you have an ulcer because you're stressed. Well, it turned out it was a bacterium. And so then suddenly uh, people started going to the doctors with back problems and saying, well, you know, it's, and he realized, okay, why do we suddenly have a, a, an epidemic of back problems? Is something changed between the late eighties and the early nineties? And what he found when he, when he would take um, MRIs of people's backs, it didn't matter. Once you're over 30, you're going to have a compressed disc or you're going to have something wrong with your back because, you know, that's just the nature of time. It works on our bodies and, and it creates problems, but he was really fascinated by, okay, who is, who is having the pain? So if all of us have these structural abnormalities uh, that happen over time, why are some people feeling pain and some are not? And he actually linked it to suppressed rage. Uh, you, you, he, he linked it to a type of personality that is always doing good, is always trying to be perfect, is always supportive of others. Now, get the word support, right, which is a back word, and it's a Saturn word. And people who are overly responsible, again, another Saturn word. And so he often would say, look at where the pain is in your body, in your back, and the part where it is. So if you have lower back pain, he would say to some of his uh, patients, who were receptive to the idea that they could work with this psychological part of it, because you have to be receptive to it. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to work. Okay. And he would say, look, a lot of men have lower back pain because they're holding up their families and they're extremely financially stressed. And so, uh, you know, they can't, they can't feel, they can't express rage because they love their family. And so what happens is the body takes that rage and gives you the signal almost to say, hey, you're, you're not doing well. You're, you're, you're really falling apart. And I mm -hmm. thought that was really interesting from the perspective of A, the back, which is where we, a lot of people have a, a problem with. And it's association with the responsibility. Because one thing I have noted is that a lot of Saturn people feel tremendous responsibility. And, uh, and uh, you know, they will take on more responsibility than they should. And they will overwork. You know, you, know, you see this with Saturn squares to the sun. People I know who have that, uh, a lot of them in my own family, tend to be overworkers. They, there seems to be a need never or a fear. And that's another word that I want to bring in here, because I think Saturn is often being said to be where wherever your Saturn is, is where you fear um, stuff. So I was talking about this the other day to my group that my Saturn's in the 12th, right? And that uh, I, I remembered a story that Marie-Louise Montfrance tells. Uh, she was uh, one of the, I think, the best students that Jung had and wrote a lot after him about how she ended up doing this sort of semi-retreat by going into a cabin by herself. And she said, you know, she's very developed and whatever. But day two, she started thinking people were trying to break into her cabin. And, you know, so she she grabbed an axe and put it next to, and she was like in the middle of like, you know, in, in some place in Switzerland, you know, bandits didn't walk around trying to break in. So her rational self by day three or four, she thought, this is this is ridiculous. What's going on here? And because she was a good Jungian, she realized that what was trying to break through were uh, uh, portions of her unconscious. And she was externalizing it or projecting it onto the outside world thinking. So she let go of the axe and she opened the door and she unlocked it. And she said, 
what it's telling me is that I need to deal with my own fears. And I think that's a very Saturn and 12th house kind of signification because the, 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 I think the veil between the conscious and the unconscious can be a bit thin there. And so it's very easy to be overwhelmed. So I want you to speak to this concept of Saturn being where maybe where your fears are lying and that where you have to work a little bit harder to make them conscious so that, uh, that you don't suffer in the way that she was suffering until she recognized what was up. Yeah, no, very true. Uh, and, uh, as an astrologer, I believe it was Mark Edmund Jones. He was a 20th century well-known astrologer. Yes. He coined it as Saturn is your overcompensation point. Yeah. It's where you feel like you're constantly having to adjust something. Now, you can think of that as a problem, or you can think of it as an amazing asset because Saturn being a long-term planet, if a person is able to channel that overcompensation in a reasonably wholesome way, they can make tremendous progress. So a person Saturn can be a really powerful point that has been built over time and experience and so forth. And it can be a huge problem if you've mismanaged it because fear, for example, is another form of contraction. Yes. Now, at the same time, fear is part of your, uh, literally your immune system, which is another Saturn keyword. Any defense system in the body is Saturn, the perimeter. Right. The, the, the walls you're setting up to protect your life, including fear. You know, if suddenly you see a gun or a big snake, it's better to be a little scared and get the heck out of there. <laughs> if you right. don't have that, you're not going to make it. Yeah. So all these archetypes are workable. And one would also say, no, it's not good to be fearful all the time. That would mean, you, you know, especially fears that are manufactured by your own right. imagination. Right. Like for like what the ex example you uh, brought up, the person through the solitude and the and so forth, starts to get this feeling, oh, there's something could be going on. There's nothing going on, but yes. the fear is there. So then she realizes, oh, okay, I can I can transcend this. And right. that doesn't mean you give up your your ability <clears throat> when necessary, <clears throat> excuse me, to feel it as a warning, but uh, eliminate those that are not that are not useful. Same with overcompensating. Totally true that person working a lot and uh, taking on too much responsibility. Saturn is the idea from an, another yet another vantage point. It's what society, in a sense, tells us we should be doing. It's the superego notion right. of these are the rules we all follow. Well, if you follow them too much, you're overcompensating too much, and then you will get results that are not so wholesome. So there you, you, know, you say, well, what is the solution? What do I do with all this? Probably use the Saturn as the very first layer to focalize your mind and become more and more aware of these patterns so that you can make good choices and drop the things that are going to you know downtrend you and and potentially even depress you as you said earlier because depression yeah it's another concave compressed feeling you know of being narrow and and the, you know the opposite of what you want to feel right right it's interesting i was thinking about the difference between saturn is in its rulership of uh Capricorn and then Saturn in its rulership of Aquarius, because those two signs just seem so different. Both are aimed at structures, but they're very different structures because one is Earth, so that's Saturn and Capricorn. So that's why banks and government, I think, are ruled. Uh, you find them in Capricorn. They're Saturnian structures, and that you build them, and and uh, you know they're 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 still social because it's a social sign, but they're 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 very physically grounded, like they can touch them, right? And you get to the Saturn in Aquarius, and it's much more about societal uh, structures that we build, collectives, uh, the communication that we create between us to in in service of something, a vision that is that is. So there's still a structure, but it's an airy structure, I think. And I was thinking that I'm really fascinated by. In fact, I was part of my novel was going to be talking about how it's interesting how many there are a couple of thinkers I think about when I think of uh, Aquarius, and one of them is Marsilio Ficino. And he had, he was the guy in the 15th century who did all the translations for uh, Cosimo de' Medici, which spearheaded the Renaissance. He brought, they brought back all these Greek texts and he, and he was an astrologer and a priest. So he had a kind of a weird uh, relationship to astrology because he was very worried about some parts of it as it would, it would completely, but, you know, he had a great understanding of music and he would, you know, someone once said that really basically music is, is numbers put into, into some auditory form. So it's beautiful. So he understood the relationship of all of these things. And he knew his chart and he was born, interestingly enough, with Aquarius rising and Saturn right on the ascendant. And he suffered from a physical infirmity that made him, made him be in pain a lot of his life. And he attributed that to the power of Saturn in his chart. 
30 years later, Pico de, Mal de la Mirandola, another big Renaissance uh, mind, comes on and is actually quite angry against astrology for, for reasons we won't get into, but a big Renaissance mind, also born because it's 30 years later with Aquarius rising and Saturn on, on the ascended. And then the person that you know I look a lot to and I find his work has been very inspirational to me is Carl Jung. Sat Aquarius rising with Saturn right on the ascendant as well in the first house. And all of these people, what's interesting about them is they bro broke through barriers. They broke through barriers of thought, right? Because it's Aquarius. They, they brought a new, in the, but here's what's interesting. Uh, in the case of the first two, they, they're bringing thought from the past. So that's Saturn, right? The past is off the history, everything too. They're bringing uh, thoughts from the past, ideas from the past, and they're reintroducing them into the world with a spin because, you know, then hundreds of years have passed. Jung does actually fundamentally the same thing. He goes back to the Gnostic thinkers. He goes back to alchemy. He goes back to all these things that have been forgotten, and he brings it back into the conversation. So I'm really fascinated by these Aquarian figures. You know, who all of them in their own way, by the way, suffered in life because, uh, you know, Jung uh, almost experienced a psychotic breakdown when he was in his mid 30s. You know, this is what the whole Red Book was about. So it wasn't easy as a life. And, they, you know, they were shunned by their peers in some cases, in the case of Jung. Uh, it, it wasn't an easy life, but they were so instrumental in bringing back old knowledge into in into the conversation again so that we can re-examine it and move the story along because that was what Jung's idea was that we were evolving in consciousness and we needed some sometimes that not all knowledge is new knowledge it's actually often knowledge that has been around and that needs to be looked at again and reinterpreted and re reintegrated uh, what do you think of that have you seen any correlation with the Saturn the differences between Saturn and Aquarius and the Saturn and Capricorn archetypes well I would say that Capricorn is more more purely the institutions, like, for example, think of buildings, government buildings, the government at large, the structure of society in a, in a you know, very tangible material sense. And banks, uh, banks I linked to Scorpio more than Capricorn, oh, but, but the idea of the, of the building itself or yes. the, the, the whole idea of the, the banking infrastructure does have connections to Capricorn as well. Uh, when you get into Aquarius, because now it's air. So if you think of Aquarius as the third air sign, it's also at the, the 11th sign of the journey of the soul, let's call it that. Right. So it's the, the pinnacle in a way of what we know or what we, we want to become or what we want to express in consciousness. Yes. And so that's why, for example, the Aquarius is associated with hopes and wishes. It's the idea of, well, what would I like this to manifest in my life? Uh, and some of that, by the way, involves other people. I mean, like, who lives in a cave manifesting yeah. things rarely. Yeah. So it's a very social type of energy. But I think what you say is correct. It's it's the difference between Capricorn and Aquarius. Aquarius is more knowledge oriented, being an air sign. In fact, you may have seen those, you know, very quick, fast things around uh, the words for the signs. And Aquarius, yes. it's what I know. And indeed, you will notice. That, which is a bit of a comedic thing that people with moon and Aquarius, because the moon gives them a sense of connection and security are constantly name dropping. I know this person. I know that person. This person <laughs> they're all, <laughs> to people that don't have the moon and Aquarius, they think, why, why are you, why are you going on? People? But it's, it's that sense of this person is in my social sphere, <laughs> Aquarius. Yeah. I know who they are because I know them. This gives me comfort and I'm hoping it'll give you comfort, which it may not, but that's, that's the reason. Yeah. And, uh, to me, the, the bottom line to this is that the Capricorn in that way uh, is more tangibly material, you know, earthy, practical, functional, and the Aquarian is much more likely to get into systems of thought like the people that you mentioned, right? Where yeah. they're looking at the past in part and trying to bring in a, a new understanding, which is a bit, it's a somewhat paradoxical because Saturn, you, you're right, would be more associated with what already has happened, history. But Aquarius is trying to break into new dimensions. Right, right. right. And yet right. Saturn is part of that too, because you can't break into those dimensions just with Uranus. That's right, why right. I think yeah, no, keeping yeah. it connected to Saturn, Saturn and Aquarius, yeah. which by the way, there are many Aquarians who, because of the Saturn influence, can be incredibly conservative. So people are always thinking, oh, every Aquarian is this innovative rebellion. No, that's not true. Rebellion oriented person. Yes, it happens, but not always. One of the gods that's associated with the Capricorn period is Janus, who has two faces. And I think when I think of Saturn, well, I think of Capricorn. the 
<laughs> well, well, no, I think of actually the two faces of Saturn, really. I associate it more with one looks back to the back, oh, to, yes. the, to the past, right. and Saturn looks forward to the future. That's the two faces. And I find the Aquarius does look forth uh, to the future, but you're right. It doesn't necessarily want to demolish all structures. It's just trying to build on what they know uh, and, and take it in a different direction. Whereas I find the Saturn... Um, and Capricorn could be more stolidly conservative. They say, no, you can't change anything, you know? And it reminds me, and we can segue into the story of Saturn and Jupiter. And I wonder if that fear of the new, you know, because you you meet that really, and, and this is where you find them in politics, right? They, it has to be like, you know, the constitution said, or it has to be like the Magna Carta says, or I mean, nobody ever says that, thank God. But it's the idea that you can't change structures because the structures hold some sort of power and magic. And it keeps the society from moving ahead because we all change. I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. part of what we do, right? Um, and so I was thinking about Saturn in Capricorn from that perspective and, and trying to understand the fear. And this does relate to fear that I think the conservative mindset, the extreme conservative mindset does think that way because they're afraid. They they can't, as materialists, they don't have that, that, that view into the future that Saturn Aquarius gives you perhaps that mm -hmm. says, you know, it's not all going to be, you know, uh, the end of the world. It can be something that actually materializes into something that is more positive. So uniting those things. Well, one thing I do notice about Saturn and Aquarius people, so Saturn being, being in domicile and Aquarius strong, is that they're very obsessed with knowledge. It's like the fear is overcome. And, and you know, I know this personally, and, uh, and many of the people I know have that placement. It's almost like you feel that you can master the world. If you can just have enough knowledge, then you're going to be okay. So you're always looking, searching, reading, uh, investigating, exploring, and you never get to the end of the game because you never, you know, it's inside, right? So you keep looking for it in the outside world. And of course, you see around, I'm surrounded by 3,000 books and I will buy 10 more tomorrow. And I realize that this is a tendency to be thirsty, mm -hmm. to think, okay, if only I can get enough knowledge, then I can, you know, protect myself against the instability that lies at the core of the world. But I do think Aquarius is much more forward-looking in that way, and that um, it's nice to have a bit of that kind of orientation, because if you only get stuck in the past, and I think structures are necessary, you can't get rid of structures, but they do need to evolve and they need to be renewed. And I think the Capricorn Saturn really struggles with that concept. It doesn't really like to, it likes to be secure. In its, and, and I think I think of the dragon, I think of how dragons, um, you know, hoard because they're afraid. So they sit on the treasure and don't do anything. And I think the Aquarius is ready to let go of that and say, no, okay, we can disperse because it's air and we can share our knowledge and we can share our wealth of knowledge and maybe get a new, new thing going. So to that end, let's talk uh, uh, about Saturn, Jupiter and their relationship and myth, as we talked about last time, is that, of course, there's a long line of father killing son or sorry, son killing the father. Um, and it starts with Uranus, which was castrated by Saturn. Uh, and, you know, basically that's that's how that power structure ends. Now we have Saturn, who in the signification is so great. It so aligns with how it functions in a chart, who is swallowing his children because he's afraid they will take over his power. So think about uh, swallowing something, repressing it to such a great degree that you will get rid of it. And of course, He's hurting his wife, Rhea, his sister wife, who eventually um, takes the, the son Jupiter or Zeus and and uh, instead of giving the son when he's born to 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 uh, Kronos to eat, to Saturn to eat, to to swallow, she gives him a stone swaddled, you know, a stone swaddled in a and so he doesn't know that he's he's actually not ingesting his his son, but you know. And so then the son is raised until he's old enough to come back. He's raised on an island far away, so he comes back and then takes on the father and um, and destroys the father. And so it's really interesting when I think of Jupiter as possibility and Saturn as structures that exist and are bound by time, that one of the things that's, that's so important about these two and why I think astrologers used to look at it so much in the past is that they're, they're really looking at two different different aspects of reality, right? And the problem is that when you get these Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions in the sky, as we did on December 21st, 2020, uh, was it 2020 or 2021? Yes, 2020. 2020, right. It was 2020. Initiating these air conjunctions, right? I think I've been playing around a lot with this. I think what it's saying is we need, and we're saying it, by the way, all the air things are coming out from AI to all these, this, these things that are also, you know, Pluto going into Aquarius, also bringing this really into the open. 
the idea that we need new thinking, we need new ways of approaching the world. And it's not going to be done with structures anymore. It's now, yeah, I think if you looked at the great earth period that we've had, Jupiter, Saturn conjuncting over the last 200 years, we've built great structures. We have built, you know, fantastic ways to manage uh, things, but we've also destroyed the earth at the same time by being not aware of it. So if you were, and of course, nobody can predict anything, but if you were to imagine what the air fit, because I go back to the last time it was in air, and that was in the 12th century. And it was it was the time when they were building these grand cathedrals, which are very airy and trying to reach the air. But it was also a time of intellectual renewal, you know, in many ways. So I'm wondering where you think, like if you were to theorize about the idea of air and these two, the king, the young king, which is Jupiter, obviously, and the old king meeting in these, in these, these new, and of course they met at zero degrees Aquarius, where Pluto is right now as we speak. So it's kind of interesting. We're going through that moment of that, that zero point is so important to this whole story. And Aquarius is important to the story because that's what initiates this whole, this whole cycle. What would, how would you put it together? How would you bring these two concepts together in your mind? Well, I think in a, in a way, a, a clue comes from the Jupiter, Saturn, and Libra, which was within the many Earth conjunctions that happened over many years. But that one was in air, and then we got a, had another one in Earth, in Taurus, right. in 99, 20 years after that. But that air conjunction, if you think about what happened there, that was the explosion of computers yeah. and it actually launched the internet uh which then you know in a sense you could connect that more to air for sure right and uh but the logic is that the air uh element really expanded in a big way so now we're, we hear things like ai and uh the development of more and more computing uh the internet is huge now everybody's more connected the connection to me, when you think of internet, that's definitely an Aquarian principle. Right. See, the oh, more people being connected. The thing, though, is that Aquarius too has that quality of unpredictability. If you link it mm. to, to to Uranus, you're playing with electricity. Pff, you don't know where, where it's going to go. It's going to go somewhere. Right. Yeah. So some of it is very difficult to to you know imagine because it, it, I mean, think about a person. If you drop a person from the 12th century in a time capsule and you put them <laughs> today they would have a really hard time figuring out what the hell was going on you know yeah. it would probably take them a month sure. why do you do a month it? more <laughs> or, probably yeah, a lot more quite a while because it is be so strange so imagine someone now computers they tend to the whole idea of of technology is logarithmic it it, exp it starts to build on itself so that it's possible one of us projected forward 30 years and we'd have a hard time understanding yeah. Yeah. What, what was happening which means likely a very big acceleration of all of that over these 20 years. You know? yeah. And the only thing I can hope for, though, is that the communication side of it can remain as benign as possible right. so that the true Aquarian principle on the upside can manifest, meaning more people benefit rather than less. Because right. this whole thing that's been going on, I think mostly linked to Pluto going through Capricorn, this the way it similarly did it back in uh, in cancer that axis tends to promote and attract fascism and you know yeah. centralizing the power from the top down and where aquarius is at least the potential for it to to reward more people uh, and right. i think it's reflected in history at least so far as well so right. I, I have some hope uh and you know that it's not just going to be all the evil it'll be there'll be plenty i'm sure because yeah. You know, as soon as you say Aquarius groups, uh, the the tech, the whole tech industry is Aquarian and so forth. But that would be the, you know, the realm of possibility, right? That it could spread. Well, to people. I mean, you know, to go no further, if Pluto through its its uh, transit through Capricorn between 2008 and just recently it, it departed 2023, that consolidated power in the hands of billionaires, right? People with who are, who are structurally, you know, whatever. I think if you're going into Aquarius, the fear I would have is that it would uh, concentrate the power, Pluto, again, power, in the hands of people who control the means of communication. And when you see what goes on with Elon Musk and Twitter, that, that should scare the hell out of you. Because, you know, when you control how what people are listening to, and you see this in all over the world, the quality of the information you receive, especially for people who are, you know, not getting informed in many ways, 
uh, can make them dangerous and it can make it, uh, you know, it's a, it's a huge problem. So I do see the, um, and it's interesting you mentioned the period between 1980 and 2000, of course, the, the first 10 years of that were the, the personal computer. And then the second uh, decade of that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction was the internet. The email, I think the first email was was uh, that I ever heard about was 1993. Someone was sending an email from where I was at. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And then the World Wide Web gets on late in the 90s. And then it's interesting that you move to the last Earth period because that's what happens with these Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions. It's like there's a gasp of the new and then you get the last throws of the old. If you think about it, they build the structures that allowed for these to become mass things. What, how did you do that? Through a smartphone. You know, um, when when I first saw a smart, smartphone 2004 or whatever, I thought, ah, that's yeah, only a couple of people had it. Little did I know that we'd all be walking around with these incredibly powerful computers, uh, you know, 10 years later, or even less. And so you're thinking to yourself, okay, that is one of the dangers. Concentration, Pluto concentrates power. It's about power in the hands of people who can be unethical, who want to control. And so it's going to be interesting how it goes. I think we all have to be aware that, of course, you can always shut off the internet, but can you really? A lot of people work on it and you can't do that anymore. So there are a lot of really interesting ethical issues, but I will leave it with this, with the Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions happening in air. The last time Pluto was in, in Aquarius uh, was uh, uh, in the late uh, late 18, 1700s, which is, of course, when you had the French Revolution, you had the uh, American Revolution, you had the Industrial Revolution. And what you said is right. It points to the Aquarius and Saturn in Aquarius being about the people. You know, the people will have a say <laughs> how they have, how they say it, whether they'll storm the Bastille or, you know, storm the Capitol. I don't know. This is going to be something we all have to decide how we're uh, what part and, and how we see how we're going to cooperate because it should be about cooperation. But it's uh, it's an interesting, you know, the curse may you live in interesting times. I think we are living through very interesting times. And I think all the attention that's happening with chat GPT and the, and by the way, I mean, great possibility there, right? From medical training to there's, it has great potential to do good as well because everything has its shadow side. But I think we have to be aware that both are operating on at them the same time. I'm an information freak. So I love the fact that I, I use chat GPT all the time. But the other day I had an experience with it just to leave people with this thought where someone was asking me, I post a lot of uh, quotes on Twitter and I get asked, oh, sometimes I, the, the name of the book doesn't fit. So someone will ask me, oh, can you tell me where this book is from? And so I didn't get to it because I was busy. So they responded to me and they said, no, I, I asked GPT and you said this was a quote by Barbara Hanna, but it tells me it's Carl Jung. And then I said, are you sure it's Carl Jung? I asked GPT because it looks like it might be Barbara Hanna. And so she said, oh, and then I got the right answer. She said, no, no, I'm sorry. I was wrong. It's a book by Barbara Hanna. Well, chat GPT was wrong both times. It wasn't a book by, by uh, Carl Jung. And it was a book by Barbara Hanna. But the chat GPT gave her the wrong name, title of the book. And so I thought to myself, we're taking, you, we, you know, this is kind of like a metaphor for be very careful you know, that the information that you're getting is the information that's actually the one you want or the one that's even true. And so the possibilities for misuse of this is going to be pretty tremendous. But anyway, that's what makes it interesting. So next time we actually are going to go and go to the archetypal planets, the truly, the ones that are, that were not seen until the 18th century and filter into consciousness in a much different way than from the seven invisible planets. And so, yeah, so let's meet up next time then. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for listening today. If you want to hear more about all of this, go to YouTube where you will find Andre's channel called Astrology Alert. He posts videos there almost daily. He also teaches classes through his Patreon account. You can find me at sophiacycles.com. If you want to support my work, I've recently released a new novel called Invocation, which you may find of interest. Go to my website to see a book trailer about it. It's available in all fine bookstores, including Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Finally, if you like this podcast, please rate it and leave a review so that others will find it as well.